I long with all of my heart to preach exactly and only what God would have me to. But I'll tell you what, from time to time, the Lord just lets me scrape my nose in the dirt. He just clogs my brain up till words won't come right and reminds me that it's his help that makes the difference. So I certainly acknowledge the need of his help tonight. And I brought two or three sermons. Maybe the best answer would be to preach all of them. <laughs> but you wouldn't get home for a while if I did that. <laughs> you wouldn't even get back to your room for a while if I did that. But I have felt, I had felt throughout the week when I discovered that, that it would be my lot to preach tonight, I'd felt my heart directed to something that is not really what I would call a last Sunday night sermon. And so I brought some last Sunday night sermons with me. <laughs> but I feel that the Lord has directed my mind back to something that relates to if I have had any theme this camp that relates to that. And that is that with all of the joys and the blessings that we have shared here in camp meeting. Now the time comes to load up the car, hook up the trailer, and pull out the gate. And when you do, you're going to go back into a world that's a whole lot different than camp meeting. And I have to tell you that while I value camp meeting every bit as much as you do, and maybe more, for I see it as a time when God brings together people from a whole cross-section of churches and it affords us a wonderful opportunity to experience the refreshing of the Spirit and the quickening of our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Yet I realize that really it's where the rubber meets the road that the difference is going to be made. It's not here. It's out there. It's when you go back to your church, back to the place where you work, back to your home community where everybody knows you, back to that little handful of, of believers that you pastor. That's where we desperately need God's help. Now, part of the reason we come to camp meeting is so God can help us here and we can take that back. But altogether, too many times, our lives, I think, have been characterized by surges, I'll call them. That is, we operate on this level, and periodically we surge into a higher spiritual realm. Sometimes it happens at camp meeting. Sometimes it happens at minister's conference, whatever you call that in the pilgrims. Sometimes it happens during revivals. We surge. But very often, if you look back across your life, you'll see that a life of surging simply gives you a graph that looks something like this. Because often we come right back down to operate on the level we've been operating on. One songwriter said, I'm tired of being blessed and not changed. Some time ago, God issued a call to me, and that call was simply this. Rather than surging, let's move up to a new spiritual level and live on that level. Let's raise the overall atmosphere of life. Now, when I say surging, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about dropping back into sin. Some people do that. Some people start their surge down here, and they surge up out of sin for a while and then drop back down in. But there are a lot of us. There are a lot of good people. There are a lot of pastors and pastors' wives. There are a lot of people who have spiritual responsibility, who don't operate on that, that level of dropping back down into sin, but they do operate on a spiritual level that has produced the overall climate that we experience. I sat in a bank some time ago in the bank president's office, and on the wall was this little motto. It said, if we do what we've always done, we'll get what we've always received. And that's absolutely the truth. 
If you go back home to the same humdrum, if you go back to your church to the same sporadic devotional life, if you go back to just reading your Bible and putting in your marker or saying all of those cliches that we learn in the place of prayer, if you go back to do what you've always done, then you can anticipate that you'll receive exactly what you've always received. And so we'll rock along at a certain level. We'll rock along with a certain number. We'll rock along with a certain spiritual fervency. And someone will come along and crank our wheel and we'll spur us on in revival and we'll surge, but then we'll settle back. Or we'll come to camp meeting next year and we'll surge, but we'll settle back. One of the reasons I enjoy early morning prayer meetings so much in camp meeting is because of the benefit that comes from corporate prayer. If I'm not getting through, you may be. And if you're not getting through, I may be. And somewhere along the line, you reach me a hand and I reach one to you and together God lifts us. That's wonderful. But you know, you go back home, you don't have a tabernacle half filled with people praying. It's wonderful to sit together around the Word. But you know... There's sometimes when everybody's gone and there's nobody there to share with us, boy, our reading can get awful dry, can it? And so life settles back down. And my concern is to see God help us until we move to a new spiritual level. Call it revival, call it whatever you want. But the cry of my heart is, God, do something for us. Help us in some way that we'll move to a new spiritual plane until we'll find a new fountain of divine grace in our heart, until we'll develop a new relationship and have a new passion and a new vision and a new heart cry and a new desire. I believe God wants to do that for us. And I feel like it's all bound up in the ministry of the Holy Spirit among us. You know, I've watched us across the years as we've let different groups of people steal away certain things. I've watched as they've robbed us of divine healing. Frankly, as I prayed along this altar in that spontaneous healing service this week, my cry was, oh God, give your people divine healing back again. I'm sick of the likes of A.A. A. Allen and Benny Hinn taking that thing and running with it. God is glorified when people are healed. And God wants to bless his people with the anointing of his presence. You look through scripture, you read the gospels and the book of Acts and over and over and over again, it was an integral part of their ministry. My prayer is, Lord, give us that back again. Is that wrong? I don't think it is. I think we need God to give us some things back again. And I hear everybody and his brother talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit being poured out and Holy Ghost revivals and the gifts of the Spirit. And there's sometimes when I feel like there's some of us that back away from some of those things. And if we're not careful, we're going to give up another chunk of land. If we're not careful, we're going to give another, uh, up another aspect of our heritage. And I just feel like saying, not on your life. Not on your life. You're not taking that away from me. Because at the center of Jesus' promise to his disciples was the promise of the fullness of the Spirit. And tied up with that promise was purity and power and unction and anointing and evangelism and reaching the world. My heart cry and passion is, Oh God, do that for us again. I know, I know some people are going to say, Well, the Lord's coming. Why should we get all bent out of shape about that? 
I hope you won't think me, I hope you won't think me irresponsible or disrespectful, but I think we need to focus a whole lot more on doing God's work in this world than we need to focus on watching the skies to see the angel come. If you're ready when he comes, if you're ready when he comes, Amen. Amen. You're right. He's right. <laughs> Glory. Amen. Amen. Glory. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Yes, 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 Lord. I already knew that. I already knew that. Because I think Jesus wants to come and find a people ready. A people ready by doing his work. By doing his work. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. While you're turning there, let me point out to you that there are times in Scripture where symbols are used for the, the Spirit. Well, the symbols, symbols are used for a number of things. And sometimes the ministry of the Holy Spirit is given to us in symbolic terminology. For example, Jesus, the last great day of the feast in John chapter 7, stood up and said, If any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And from within him, from within him shall flow out rivers of living water. And then Scripture tells us specifically that he spoke that of the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the disciples. So we know the symbol there of the river was the symbol of the Holy Spirit. Again, at the baptism of Jesus, as John immersed him in the river Jordan and brought him up, God spoke and the heavens opened and a dove descended, the symbol of the Holy Spirit. I don't know all the characteristics of a dove, but it's obvious that God relates some of the characteristics, at least, of a dove to the ministry of the Spirit. In this verse, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, John the Baptist is speaking, and he says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So the symbolism here is the symbolism of fire. If you turn over to Acts chapter 2, you'll find there on the day of Pentecost, it says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord, Suddenly there was the sound of a rushing mighty wind and there appeared unto them cloven or dividing, flaming tongues of fire like as a fire and set upon each of them and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to speak with other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. The symbolism of fire for the ministry of the Holy Spirit took on a new significance to me some years ago when I read a little book a book that I don't think is any longer in print. It was written by a man by the name of John T. Siemens. Dr. Siemens had been a missionary for many years in India and upon his return to the States wrote this book and several others. I was in a camp meeting in the state of North Carolina and an individual there who ran the bookstore came and said that he would like to give me something. So he gave me this book. The cover was not very attractive. The title was On Tiptoe with Joy, and that didn't capture my attention. So for many years, that little book sat on the shelf, and I never read it. Several years later, as I was pastoring in our conference, we filled out monthly preacher's reports in which you told how many times you had preached, how many calls you had made, how many books you had read. And that particular month I hadn't read anything, so I was looking for a short book that I could read very quickly. You preachers will appreciate my honesty there. I wish I could tell you I'd had a deep theological motive for reading that book, but I didn't. However, as I opened the pages 
of that book and began to read, I was delightfully surprised. For behind the ugly cover and beyond the rather silly title was a book that was literally filled with wonderful things about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in His work of cleansing our hearts. Among those was a chapter on the parallelisms between the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the nature of fire. Dr. Siemens in his book pointed out that fire has, is made up of three distinct rays. First of all, there is what is called the actinic ray. And this portion of fire is the part that burns things up. Secondly, there's the caloric ray. And this part of fire is the part that produces energy, produces heat, and heat is energy. The third is the luminiferous ray, and you may have guessed that that's the part of fire which produces light. He went on to point out what should have been very obvious to me, and that was that these three aspects of fire directly relate to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. There are some things that the Holy Spirit must burn up in our life if we're to ever experience the cleansing that he wants to give. Secondly, the Holy Spirit simply must produce the power in our lives on which and by which the church runs. If we only operate on the power of organization, if we only operate on the power of human, human personality, if we only operate on the power of tradition, we will never get anywhere in winning the world for God. So the Holy Spirit's job is to provide for us the power which makes the difference between spiritual success and spiritual failure. And third, the Holy Spirit is that source of light that Jesus talked about when he said, when he has come, he will glorify me. It's by the ministry of the Spirit through human instruments that Jesus Christ is exalted and glorified in this world. Jesus clearly said, he will not speak of himself. He will not glorify himself, but he will glorify me. I want to look at these three areas tonight and relate them, if possible, to what happens to us when we pull out the gate and head for home. Areas that we need to examine. Perhaps areas that we need to examine tonight so that God can help us to retain some of the surge that we may have enjoyed in camp meeting. If we're, to, if we're to move to a new spiritual level in our lives, there are many, many, many lives, many cases, many instances when the Holy Spirit is simply going to have to burn some things up. When there are problems there in a church, there are always reasons for the problems. I remember talking to an old preacher that came to my church one time to hold us a meeting. And I'll never forget him raising his eyebrows and cocking his head as we were talking about a certain situation. And he said, always remember this, young man, where there's rough water up there, there are rocks down here. And I'm sure if Brother Gray were to take this microphone tonight and talk to you about his experience with churches across the years, there are reasons why churches become revolving doors for pastors. There are reasons why churches do not grow. There are reasons why nobody ever gets saved in some churches. There are reasons why nobody ever gets established in some churches. And often, often, I know I'm treading on a little dangerous ground here, but often there are people who stand squarely in the way of that church ever being what it needs to be. For you see, there are some people who'd rather drive the horse than follow, and they'll do it even if it costs the church. There are some people who've been on the official board long enough that they're going to run things, whoever the pastor is. There are some people that are harboring bitterness towards somebody else that's going to be an obstacle no matter how long that church stands there. 
I've had occasion to observe some churches during the time that I had responsibility in our conference. And I heard interesting things, things like, you know, it's always basically the same thing that flares up again and again and again. Revival comes and then the old rivalry between these two families shows its head. This family thinks that one's putting on the dog and that family thinks this one's jealous and they may both be right. But there's some things that no amount of good preaching is ever going to cure. There are some things no amount of good anointed singing is ever going to cure. There are some things that no amount of good camp meetings are ever going to cure. There are some things that the only cure for them is the baptism of the blessed Holy Ghost of God who cleanses and purges and purifies. And there will not be any other way. Let me show you, for example, by looking at the apostles, some of the things that would have kept the early church perennially weak and small and bickering. You stop and think for a while. The disciples were always fighting over who was going to be the greatest. They were always strutting their stuff. James and John were so sure that they ought to be Jesus' right and left-hand man when he came into his worldwide kingdom that they put their mother up to seeking that place for them. And as soon as the other disciples found out, they were angry with James and John. Even on the way to the upper room, even on the way to the garden, there was bickering over who was going to be the greatest. Jesus Christ is standing there in the shadow of the cross where he's going to become sin for all men. And they're bickering over who's going to have the first seat. You remember when they got to the Last Supper, there was nobody willing to wash feet. Nobody. They don't say a lot because Jesus is there. But if you look down that row of men, you can see it. John studiously looking up in the upper right-hand corner of the room. The wash basin is over there. Peter's deeply engaged in conversation with Thomas. Everybody's doing something because nobody wants to wash feet. But Jesus... Jesus took off his robe, put the towel on, and said, sit down, fellas, I'm washing feet tonight. I'm washing feet tonight. And as I do that, I am giving you a model to follow. If you want to be my disciple, I must wash your feet, and you must wash each other's feet. Friend, I have to tell you that there's only one cure for selfish pride, and that's the cleansing of the Holy Spirit that gets beyond us feeling guilty and saying, well, I, I kind of had a bad attitude there. You know, I'd had a rough week. And that family has been a thorn in my side ever since they've come to this church, and I do my best to put up with them, but sometimes it just gets away with me. Well, I want to tell you that there's a cure for that problem. There is a cure for that problem. <laughs> there is a cure for those lingering antagonisms. There is a cure for those lingering bad attitudes. And it's the cure of the burning, cleansing power of the blessed Holy Ghost. They were not only proud and self-seeking, but they were jealous of each other. I grew up in the Free Methodist Church. And they referred to the piano as the wooden brother. Now they'd have to call it the plastic brother. Or the electronic brother, I guess. But do you know one reason why the early free Methodists didn't have the wooden brother in the church? The reason was really relatively simple. Only the wealthy could afford music lessons. And therefore, only the children of the wealthy could play the piano. And often it became a great status symbol. It became a flaunting of our ability to train our daughter and so she can come and play the piano, as they used to call it. So they said, we don't need the wooden brother. We'll blow a pitch pipe and sing a cappella. And sing they did. But you know, 
You don't get rid of the problem by taking out the wooden brother. Uh-uh. No, you'll never get rid of the problem. Oh, I've known of churches, I think of one at this very moment, where two girls played the piano. And they were probably about even in their native abilities. But this family thought their daughter was absolutely the best, and this family thought their daughter was the best. Only this, fa this family was the preacher, and his daughter played, and this family was jealous because their daughter didn't get to play, and they said, she's better, and the only reason she plays is because she's the preacher's daughter. I think of a pioneer church in a state a long ways away from here that split wide open over who was going to play the piano. <laughs> you know, you can't teach enough theology to cure that problem. You can't grow people long enough to cure that problem. You can't mature people long enough. You can't train people in management of their feelings well enough to contain that problem. If it doesn't crop up there, it'll crop up somewhere else. There's only one cure for those kind of things, and that is the cleansing, burning presence and power of the blessed Holy Ghost of God. And some of our churches will never move off of square one until they have a cleansing. I think of these disciples with their attitudes. What do you say? Those the business of pride and jealousy is attitude. That's true. But you remember James and John, that time they saw someone else casting out evil spirits in the name of Jesus, and they said, Lord, we rebuke them because they didn't go with us. And then the time that Jesus sent them out to prepare the way. He was coming into villages and he sent them out in, in the forerunner's work. And the people didn't receive them well. And they came back and said, Lord, let's call down fire upon them. Attitudes that Jesus had to look at them and say, you don't know what kind of spirit you have. And again, you don't educate that kind of spirit away. It must be cleansed. I can't help but think of the fact that these disciples displayed a real tendency to want to go back to the world. That's right. They worried about that. They said, Lord, now other people have got their thing. What are we going to have? Lord, well, what's our cut going to be? We've, we've left all to follow you. What's our blessing going to be? They wanted to make sure that they had a high and lofty and successful place in the upcoming kingdom that they were positive was going to come. And then, of course, when Jesus died, they were quick to say, when Peter said, I'm going back to fishing, they were quick to say, we're going with you, Peter. I don't know why we wasted the last three and a half years of our life. And so I see them as they're pushing the boat off of the shore of the Sea of Galilee that evening as the sun sets. And I see Peter, the one who likes to direct, up in the front of the boat and saying, boys, I think, I think it'd be good for us to try that point right over there. You know, fish hang around the point, so let's go over there. I think we can get some fish there. And as the boat drifts across the now sparkling waters, as the moon rises, I can see Peter sniffing the breeze and letting the wind blow his hair and saying, why did I ever leave this life? Going back. Oh, and then it showed up some other ways. You remember when Peter and James and John and the disciples were there in Gethsemane when, when the, the, the mob came for Jesus. They all scrambled for cover. And I see Peter as he slinks along on the outside and then he gets in and he's standing by the enemy's fire warming himself. And a little maid comes up and says, Peter, you're one of them. I saw you with him. And Peter says, I am not. It was more important to him to fit in with the crowd around him than it was to be identified with the now condemned Son of God. We've got a lot of people with that affliction. 
hallelujah in camp meeting and help us Lord when we go back to the job you'll never win people you'll never win people they'll never ask you to come to church if you're breaking your neck to fit in with the crowd let me tell you ladies let me tell you if you go to work and you're standing on your head so to speak to look as much like them as you can and be as much like them as you can they're not gonna want what you've got they know you want what they've got and these disciples we're never going to win the world. In fact, I have to stand back and say, Lord, are you sure you picked the right guys? Lord, are you sure these are the guys that are going to take the message? Lord, three and a half years of private tutoring with a son of God, and now they come. over who's going to be the greatest running for cover when the torch lit mob comes lord they're, they're spouting their own abilities peter's saying lord when everybody else is gone old peter will be there i'll die for you and then he's cursing to prove he doesn't know him you know many 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 times the biggest problems we struggle with are problems from within but do you know there is a cure for those problems? Jesus knew these disciples' problems. He wasn't blind to their problems. He said, fellas, you're not ready to evangelize yet. You know, if you start out to evangelize with the affliction of carnality in your life, you'll be grabbing the glory and kissing the microphone and making a big show. And the end result will be you get the glory. And that's exactly the opposite of what God wants. God wants the glory to go to Him. There's only one cure for that. And that is the cleansing ministry of the Holy Spirit among us. There's only one cure. And I'm not here this evening to try to say, Oh, every church in the Pilgrim Holiness Movement has got a major problem. I'm not here to say every church in anybody's movement's got a major problem. But I don't have to tell you that we need some help. I don't have to tell you that we're struggling. I don't have to tell you that many of our churches are groping along, wondering how in this world they'll ever survive. Friend, I'm convinced tonight that at the heart of it is a need of the baptism of the blessed Holy Spirit of God that will cleanse some things until it doesn't matter what you do and what I do. It doesn't matter who gets the glory. It doesn't matter who is first on the list. It doesn't matter who gets the honor and the praise as long as God gets it. As long as God gets it. In the city of London in 1665, there was an awful plague. An awful plague that we know now was the bubonic plague. A plague that was transmitted by fleas, biting rats, whose blood was infected with this dreadful disease, and then biting humans and infecting them. But in 1665, medical science in London didn't have a clue as to what was causing this problem. And as the disease began to spread and spread and spread, it began to be called the Black Death. At first they had funerals, but eventually they got to the place where they didn't have funerals anymore. There was just a wagon that went down the muddy streets of the city of London, and a crier went along that said, Bring out the dead! Bring out the dead! And they'd bring them out and stack them like cordwood along the muddy edge of the street. And then workmen would take them and throw them up on the wagon and stack them, haul them outside the city and burn them. People were dying like flies. Medical science had tried everything within its scope of knowledge. And nothing had worked. The plague was not in the least hindered, let alone stopped. It looked like everybody in London was going to die. People were fleeing. But unfortunately, they were taking bubonic plague with them as they fled in many, many cases. In the midst of that dark, awful time, 
in one of the row houses of London, clapboard houses that were built side by side by side, a fire started. And not having the fire control facilities that we have, all they had was bucket brigades. The fire soon jumped from one house to another and another and another and another. And soon it looked like London that didn't die from the plague was going to be scorched by the great fire of London. And it raged and raged and raged and jumped streets and jumped blocks and, and whole sections of the city ended up going up in smoke. But you know when the fire finally burned itself out, the bubonic plague was cured. Because what no amount of medical expertise could do what no amount of political action could do, what no amount of human effort could do, the fire did. It reached into the cracks and crevices and killed the rats and the fleas and stopped the plague. Friend, I want to tell you today there aren't enough theology books in the seminary libraries and there aren't enough eloquent teachers and preachers. There aren't enough seminars. There aren't enough training sessions. There isn't enough of anything to accomplish this work apart from the ministry of the blessed Holy Spirit. He comes to deal with the problem. Cleanse and burn. Brother, you're hurting me instead of helping me. The Holy Spirit not only cleanses, but the Holy Spirit empowers. Now, we as holiness people have emphasized the cleansing aspect of the Holy Spirit's ministry, and rightly so. And we've emphasized it in this camp meeting. But you know... We have overlooked, and this is another chunk of land we've given away, the very clear, concise, precise promise of God that the Holy Spirit will give power for effective Christian service. And that promise has not changed. As I told you this morning, God has no change within his character. What he said yesterday, he means today. What he gave then, he can give now. You may say, well, is he going to give an upper room experience? No. God's too big to be put in your box or mine or anybody else's. But there's an underlying thread of consistency that runs clear through the work and ministry of the Spirit in any age, in any generation. And that is that the Holy Spirit gives power, but he gives power to purified people. If you want to see what happens when you have people with enormous power who have not had their hearts made pure in love, take a look at some of the grand messes we have seen in the religious world in the last decade. Men who had money galore, men who spoke to mighty crowds, men who, had, men who had access all around the world. But the end result of their life was colossal shame and failure. Do you know why? Because their emphasis was on the gift of tongues. Their emphasis was on building mega churches and mega centers and mega everything else. We're not ready for mega anything until we've had a mega cleansing. I listened to one preacher preach and he told a sad story in a sense of a tragic, tragic situation in church struggles. He ended up being relieved of his responsibilities. He staggered away from that situation reeling. Bitterness clawed at his soul. Misunderstanding was rife. He was an open sore into which the devil could throw all of the temptations that naturally come. But in the midst of that, the blessed Holy Spirit began to zero in on him and say, Son, if you'll allow me to deepen my work in your life, I'll broaden your ministry. 
And he testifies on this side of that dark, dark, dark situation in his life as he waited before God and allowed the blessed Holy Ghost to pour him the healing balm and get the wound closed and then teach him some things about himself and show him his heart, and cleanse his heart and make him over. Then God had a vessel through which he could pour his presence and power, his unction and anointing, and God could get all the glory. He must have a clean vessel before he can fill that vessel with power. It's obvious when I look at the disciples that they weren't winning the world. Jesus has just hung on the cross. And as he hangs there suspended between heaven and earth, he surges against the nails and says, it is finished. We have preached for years on Easter Sundays about the finished work of Calvary. Do you know where the church was right about that time? Well, they're out there hiding in the bushes. A few women got enough courage to come and stand at the foot of the cross. The disciples of Jesus are nowhere to be seen, scared to death. In fact, after he's buried, they're huddled together in an upper room, scared to death for fear of the Jews. Listen to the two of them as they walk down the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. You can almost see them kicking dust as they walk down that road. Their hopes are dashed. Their dreams have evaporated, bursting like ch children's soap bubbles. And then mysteriously, another person is there walking with them. And he asks, why are you so sad? They say, don't you know? Are you new to the area? Don't you understand what's been going on? And they recount, we had hoped. Listen to the past tense. We had hoped that he was the Messiah. But it's obvious that that hope is definitely in the past tense. And Jesus walks along with them. The scripture says their eyes are holding until they can't see him. He walks along with them and begins to expound his word and show how the Messiah must suffer. These disciples aren't ready to win the world. They aren't ready to win anybody. They're scared to death of the Romans and the Sanhedrin. They're scared for their own necks. And here they are, shuffling along, dispirited and broken toward the city of Emmaus. You know, we got a lot of people who know where Emmaus is, don't we? Oh, Lord, we'd hoped that you'd really help in a revival. Oh, Lord, we'd hoped that you'd help us to see a church established here. Oh, Lord, we had hoped that you'd help us to see some souls saved. And we're kicking up dust on the way to Emmaus. But I'm glad to tell you that there is one who is vitally interested in us. Jesus Christ didn't die just to make a mark in history. He died to see the church born. When he cried, it is finished, he meant that the bridge was done all the way from sin-cursed lives to a holy God. And he himself became that bridge. Yes. Yes. And as they invited him into the little restaurant and he sat at the table with them, the Bible says, as he broke bread and blessed it, their eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened. <laughs> there are a bunch of us that just need to have our eyes open, don't we? <laughs> we may find out Jesus is a whole lot nearer than what we thought. Their eyes were open, and then he disappeared. And I can see them as they shove back from the table and leave the food sitting there and race back up the same road they just shuffled down, back to the city of Jerusalem and their message is loud and clear he's alive he's alive he's alive but you know when they get into the upper room even though they saw him with their own eyes the other disciples are saying oh you know we've had some women come in and say that you know how women are you can't trust women no, I didn't say that that's what they were saying yeah the women were right weren't they <laughs> These people aren't ready to evangelize the world. These people aren't. These people don't have the courage to get out on the streets, let alone tell anybody about Jesus. But Jesus' specific direction was you stay in the city of Jerusalem. You tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. 
Friends, I'm afraid just a lot of times we've gotten the cart way, way, way before the horse. And we've rushed people out into things and we've rushed for this and rushed for that long before people have waited until God could cleanse and purify like He wants to, like He must before He can pour His power through. Let me just testify to you. I remember so well God calling me to preach. Words have never been hard for me. The first time I ever preached was in a Pilgrim Holiness Church in the little town of Rising Sun, and Eula Kennedy was the pastor. Anybody know Eula Kennedy? Lady preacher who helped a lot of young guys get started. And I preached for an hour the first time. Been doing it ever since. No, that's not exactly right. It's got a little longer than that. I never had any problem with words. They came easily. There's no doubt in my mind that God always intended me to be a preacher. But I'll tell you what, God and I both knew that there were some serious problems with this young fella. Words came easy. Words were glib. It was easy to stand up and say things. I'd grown up in the holiness movement. I knew the way. But I can't tell you how many times I had knelt beside a bed in the upstairs bedroom of some parsonage and said, Oh, God, would you help me preach tonight? If you'll help me, Lord, I'll give you all the glory. And then I'd go and he would. But by the time I got done, I was so busy feeling very satisfied with myself and my heart just kind of standing up on the inside that I didn't give God any of the glory. Oh, no, I was very sanctimonious on the outside. Oh, yes, the Lord helped me. Thank you very much. I've said that to you this week, haven't I? But I knew my heart and God knew my heart and many a night after I got back to the room and knelt beside that same bed to get ready to crawl into bed, the Holy Spirit would say, Son, I thought you said I was going to get the glory. But I didn't. And I'd feel terrible and I'd ask God to forgive me and I'd say, Lord, Lord, I don't know what's wrong with me. Well, Lord, I do know what's wrong with me. But Lord, I don't know what to do about it. Ask the Lord to help us sing, and he would. And I'd swell up, so proud of the good job we did. My wife sang in a ladies' trio at God's Bible School at the same time my brothers and I sang together. And I wanted them to do good because she was in that. She wasn't my wife then. She was my girlfriend. I wanted them to do well because she was in it, but I only wanted them to do well so far. I wanted them to do well just a little less than we did well. And if they really pulled a good one off, I was immediately. I never put it in words. It never crept on the outside. I was very gracious, said, y'all did a great job. I loved that song. But on the inside, I was thinking, I'll cap you the next time around. All I'm doing is telling you the truth. And there are a whole bunch of us that struggle with some of those same kind of things. And it's no wonder, it's no wonder God can't help when there's so much of us clogging the pipeline. I'll never forget, we sang the little boy from the carpenter shop and that was a bell ringer of a song. And I sang the solo. Uh -huh. The Lord just led me to do that. And you know how we, we tend to flaunt kids? Sometimes we just build egos to the sky. And so they'd call us up to sing that song, and I'd bell it out again and sing it again. And people would shout and run and go on. But I remember one time they asked us to sing it, and it just fell flat on its face. And a little old lady came by, and she said, Boys, I can't remember the exact words, but something to the effect of, Boys, the Lord could bless you. If you'd get things fixed up. She offended me. That is old crank. But you know what? That little old lady knew a whole lot more about this young man than what I ever wanted to let on. Friend, I, I have to tell you tonight 
that there were just big blocks of self in my life that wouldn't let God help. I was all over the place. I was grabbing glory, taking credit, showing off. I didn't always see all of it until the Holy Spirit began to pull the cover off. But then I began to see how the ugly, slimy tentacles of self just ran through every aspect of what I was trying to do for God. That's why when somebody else came along and did better, it just made me so jealous I couldn't see straight. I wanted to be the best. I'm not talking about you tonight. I'm talking about me so I can say what I want. But I want to tell you that even though I didn't realize all of it at the time, my channel was so clogged that God couldn't trust me. The little bit of help he did give, I abused. I abused. I grabbed it and took the glory for it. And you know, I, I don't want to be unkind, but I'm afraid there, there may well be a number of people who struggle with that same problem. The channel is just so clogged with I and my and me and mine and ours. There's so much of us on board that what little of God dribbles through really doesn't do a whole lot. And I'll never forget that Saturday morning that I told you about earlier in this meeting when God began to pull the cover off of my heart and show me the depths and the pervasiveness of carnality and self-will and self-sufficiency and self-aggrandizement and self-satisfaction and self-defense and on and on and on and on and on. These people had to have the channels clear before the power could flow. And friends, you may not shout the house down on me on this point, but I have a real concern in my heart that we need to rediscover, rediscover the secret closet where we find the end of ourself and thereby the beginning of God, where I become nothing but a hollow channel that He can flow through, where all of the, all of the rubbish of selfishness and self-will and carnality in general can be cleansed and purged until the blessed Holy Ghost can flow unhindered. Till it doesn't make any difference if you get the glory or if somebody else does or if I do. If you're chosen or if I'm chosen, it doesn't make any difference whether they mention you or whether they mention me. It doesn't make any difference. It's God first and last and in between. And when we get to that place, there are channels that are open that the power of the blessed Holy Ghost can flow through. Friend, I believe that's the hope of the tomorrows of the holiness movement. I believe with all of my heart, we need some young fellows to find themselves a secret place where they get to the end of whoever you are and you look God Almighty in the face and you're willing to die to self, die to ambition and die to everything in the world except exalting Jesus Christ. Then he has a channel that is cleansed and purged through which he can pour his power. Oh, the promises, the promises are clear. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses to me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the world. I would simply remind you these were not seminary trained people. These were not great and mighty men. These were not even eloquent speakers. Over and over again it's alluded to in Scripture that they were Galileans. They could tell by their brogue. Basically they were hillbillies. They didn't have anything to offer. But I want to tell you something. When they were empty of themselves... <laughs> When the bickering was done, when the battling for place was done, when they were forever cured from this world, when they had been cleansed on the day of Pentecost, they went out into the streets to speak simple, direct words that knocked people down in their tracks. And God the Holy Ghost was able to do a mighty saving work. 
as a result of them being cleansed channels through which divine power could flow unhindered. Dr. Siemens tells in his book about going through a hospital in India, being led around and shown around by a little Indian nurse. And he got into the operating room and he saw a strange instrument laying on a counter there, a stainless steel counter. The instrument was a tube, a cylinder, with a loop of platinum wire, very thin loop of platinum wire on the other end, on one end, and out of the other end went an electrical cord. In curiosity, he asked the little nurse, what is that? And she took it up and walked over to the wall and plugged the electrical outlet in. And when she did, the current began to flow through that little platinum wire, and it began to glow white hot. And she stood there with that thin instrument with a tiny wire on the end in her hand. And she said, when this instrument is connected to that current, it becomes a powerful tool cutting through most anything in the hands of a skilled surgeon. And friend, I want to tell you, God's not looking for people who are greatly educated. God's not looking for people with charismatic personalities. God's not looking for people with glib tongues. God's looking for people who have been so cleaned of themselves that the Holy Spirit can flow through them. Without Him, you and I are a floppy wire. But with His presence and power flowing through in our lives, He can cut through the greatest obstacles to reach to the needs of human hearts. Oh, cleansing is not an end in itself. Cleansing is simply means to a larger end. God wants to visit His church with power and unction again. God wants to do it. God will do it if we'll provide for Him the empty vessels that He can flow through. The result of that is inevitably that the light shines. That the light shines. And when the light shines, he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. If the Holy Spirit can clean the vessel, the light can get out. When I was a boy, I think I mentioned to you, we lived up near Attica, Indiana. Lived at the end of a lane. It was very, very dark out there. And we would walk from the house where my grandparents lived down to a little cabin by the Wabash River and spend the night there. And I think I mentioned to you we eventually got a railroad lantern. But before we got that railroad lantern, we had an old kerosene lamp, one of the kinds you carried with a bale on the top. And I remember walking along one night with that lamp, my father carrying it, and I was scared of the dark. I was scared there were badgers out there and all kinds of things, and so I was trying to stay as close to my dad as I could in that light, and I said, Dad, you know, that light doesn't look like it's as bright as it used to be, and I'll never forget he held it up, and he said, oh, yeah, well, I'll turn it up a little, but he said, I think the problem is the chimney's all smoked up, and I said, chimney? What do you mean? He laughed and said, well, we'll clean it in the morning, and I'll show you. And the next morning, we took off the globe of the, of the lantern, and he began to polish it up, got all that old soot off the inside. You know, if you crank those wicks up too high, they'll smoke. Oh, it burns high, but it smokes, and it blacks up the chimney. And I'll never forget him saying, you know, if you get the chimney clean and keep the chimney clean, it sheds a lot of light. And there's a reason why the Holy Spirit wants to clean us, cleanse us, purify us. Those things obstruct the shining of the light of the gospel. But when He comes to cleanse, when He flows in the oil, is, which is also a symbol of the Spirit, then He makes it so the light can shine. In the twin cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, there was a church, a very large church, down in town. Had high steeple and big slate roofs, high pitch. And one morning, a policeman walking his beat walked past that church, and as he did, he smelled, he smelled the acid smell of burning. And he quickly began to circle the church and see if there was any indication that there was a fire in or around the church building. 
And when he got to the back of the church, he saw a place where there were fingers of flame licking out right up at the soffit. He quickly radioed for fire help and more police assistance. And, and soon the wail of sirens filled the night air of Minneapolis and St. Paul. By the time the firemen got there and climbed up on the roof, the slate roof had so effectively held the heat in that that church had become a raging inferno on the inside. The thick brick walls and the heavy slate roof had kept it contained. And when the firemen ripped off the slate and punched holes through that roof, it literally rushed out of there and even injured some of the firemen. They quickly got off of the roof and all they could do was watch the old church burn and try to keep the surrounding buildings soaked so that the fire wouldn't spread to those buildings. But you know, as the fire burned, eventually the big beams gave way and the roof collapsed. And as that happened, the walls that had been so intensely hot began to crumble. And eventually, all there was was basically a pile of smoldering rubble. And as daylight began to dawn, a newspaper photographer was slipping around through the police barrier and he came around to the front of the church and there to his amazement against a backdrop of charred timbers and smoldering rubble was a beautiful life-size statue of Christ with his arms extended across the bottom of the statue were these words come unto me and rest having a creative eye he quickly dropped on his knee and took a picture of the statue of Christ against the the havoc and the rubble that lay behind it and when the papers hit the streets that morning on the front page was a colored picture and the we all get to heaven and what a day that will be and it will be worth it all and by the time we're done singing that we're shouting the high praises of God then after a while the lights go out and we crawl in our cars and we trace our way out through the darkness and go back home and people drive by that church every day and have no idea of anything about what goes on inside you know that's right that happens over and over and over again you know one of the reasons that's true one of the reasons that's true is because God never intended for things to evolve to the place that they have come. He intended for you and me to be lights in the darkness full of the Holy Ghost. Not just preachers. Stephen was a man who waited on tables and saw the widows getting their proper food. But he was a man full of the Holy Ghost. Friend, I want to tell you tonight, I believe with all of my heart, if God can cleanse us and if God can empower us, it's inevitable that the light of God's truth will shine. It's inevitable that it'll shine in the workplace. It'll shine in the home. It'll shine at family reunions. It'll shine wherever you go. So many times the only thing people see about us is the way we dress and the difference that they see in our appearance. But friend, if that's all they see, they're going to look at us the same way, way we look at the Amish. We want to drive up there into one of those Holmes County or someplace and we want to stop along the road and click pictures of them as they drive by in their buggies with their funny hats and their odd clothes. I want to be more than that. I want to be different from the world. But by God's grace, I want to be more than just a glorified Amish. I want by His grace to be a person in whose life there is the radiance of Jesus Christ. There is something that shines and shows until the world can see without me ever opening my mouth that I belong to the King. Oh, friend, when that happens, when that happens, the church becomes people out there rather than a group in here.
the church becomes a light out there at that factory and a light over there in that store and a light in this office and a light down that road and a light over here. That's exactly what God wants. He wants you to be a one man, one woman representative for him when nobody else is around and we aren't singing it will be worth it all. He wants you to have the light of God burning in your soul until people can see and know and understand that there's something different in your life. I had a lady in our church testify about something that gripped me. She worked for a large corporation that makes these little condiments, ketchup, mustard, uh, mayonnaise, whatever, sends them out. She worked in the office, excellent secretary. One day one of the girls was sick and they asked her to run the front desk. And you came in the entrance of this factory and turned to your right to go into the, the plant and turned to your left to go in the office complex. So there was a swinging set of doors here that went into the plant. She was sitting there at the front desk when all of a sudden those swinging doors swung open and a young man walked in and up to the edge of that desk and looked intently at her. And he said, ma'am, I don't know you and you don't know me. But I noticed right off that you were a Christian by the way you looked. And he said, I've watched you, and I'm convinced that you love Jesus. And I'm in trouble. My home's in trouble. My life's in a mess, and I need somebody to pray for me. Would you please pray for me? She was stunned. She said, well, 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 well sure. The young man said, thanks. Thanks. You don't know how much I needed that. And he turned around and disappeared back through the double doors. I can't help but think God wants to do that with every person in this building tonight. When you walk in the hardware store, they want to say there. God wants them to be able to say there goes a Christian. You say, well, how will they know? I don't know. I can't explain the mysteries of the Spirit. But I know I've been at the store in work clothes and had people say, would you by any chance be a Christian? Ladies, let me talk to you. It's time we stop this business of feeling odd about the way we dress. Do you realize what a powerful testimony it is? I don't think Shane will mind me telling a story about his mother who's a nurse, a county health nurse. And she was going around, she was going to take a job going around with another lady who'd been doing that job. And they went to a home where there was a young couple had a baby that was in trouble. They examined the baby and the couple was obviously very concerned. And the young man began to ask Sheila, Shane's mom, if she was a Christian. And she said, well, yes, I am. And he told her something about how he tried to serve God. And he asked her to pray for the baby. She said she would. If I remember correctly, she prayed right then. And they turned around and went and got back in the car. The other nurse riding with her, after they had ridden a little while, said, I don't understand that. I've been going to that house for months, for weeks. And he never said anything to me like that. Why do you suppose he said that to you? You'd have to know Sheila. But she said, you know that. <laughs> and pointed to the knot that she had on the back of her head. You know, I think it's time we recognize that rather than being on the defensive, we ought to be on the offensive. I think we ought to recognize that one of the reasons God wants a Christian different from the world is because there's a testimony in that. They don't, accuse, they don't look at you dressed like a Christian and say, well, are you, are you a part of some occult crowd? No. The first thing they ask you is, what church do you go to? You say, well, I never get a chance to witness to people. You don't? Do you ever go to the mall? you ever go to Walmart? You watch him watch you. As you're going through the checkout line, they always want to say something. They do. Oh, your hair is so pretty. How do you do that? But you know, if all we've got 
is distinctive standards and lifestyles. We don't have much. We don't have much. But oh, if the Holy Spirit can fill us. <laughs> If the Holy Spirit can fill us, friend, if the Holy Spirit can shine through our lives, we can be a witness to a dark and desperately needy world. Too many times we've got the mentality the devil's foisted the mess off on us. Ah, oh, nobody else is going to want to go this way. Why did you? I'll tell you why you did. Because God the Holy Ghost began to talk to your heart. And when God the Holy Ghost begins to talk to anybody's heart, they become a prime candidate for some real transformations. And friend, when everything is said and done, we don't win the battle on the level of human operation. We don't win the, level be the battle because we're attractive. We win the battle because we have the presence and power of the blessed Holy Ghost of God. <laughs> That's why we need him to cleanse. That's why we need him to fill. That's why we need him to overshadow. That's why we need his power, his unction, and his authority. Yes. Dr. E. Stanley Jones, veteran missionary, said, I went to India with this conviction, and my years there did nothing but verify it. It is either it is that Pentecost is not a spiritual luxury. It is an utter necessity for human living. He went on to say, the, holy, the human spirit fails unless the Holy Spirit fills. We are shut up to this alternative, Pentecost or failure. Now, friends, if you remember one thing that I've said in this camp meeting, I hope you'll remember when you walk away from here that God wants us to do more than surge at camp meeting time. God wants us to move up to a new level of living. God wants us to move up to a new level of fullness. God wants to stretch out places in our heart. God wants to take some things out of our life. God wants to expand our borders and enlarge our horizons and then fill us with himself. If he can do that, there will be more light in the city that you live in. There will be more light in the factory that you work at. There will be more light on your street. There will be more light at your family reunion. In Yosemite National Park, there is a tourist attraction called the Fire Fall. And that Fire Fall is located at Camp Curry. Camp Curry is the base of a, about a thousand foot granite cliff. And up on top of that granite cliff, there are park rangers who throughout the day burn wood and cook down, you might say, or burn down a bed of coals. Camp Curry is at the bottom. There's a natural grassy amphitheater. And the tourist, as night begins to fall, the tourists come wandering into the little amphitheater they bring their park, they bring their, their lawn chairs and they bring their, their quilts and they sit down and wait. And as darkness settles in, the ranger goes out and he tries to make sure everybody's far enough back. And if everything just seems to be okay, he calls up, Is the fire ready? And if the fire is ready, the ranger on the top calls back down. The fire's ready. Is Camp Curry ready? He makes one last check to make sure all the children are back and everyone's away from the base of the cliff. And then with a dramatic flare, he says, Camp Curry's ready and let the fire fall. And as he shouts that out, the rangers on the top with great paddles begin to push those glowing coals over the edge of that granite cliff. And as they run down through the night darkness, run down, drop down through the air, they're fanned into flame. And soon there's a blazing wall of fire a thousand feet high. A display that you'll never forget if you see it. But I can't help but think tonight that the God of heaven looks over into our camp meeting and looks over into our churches and looks over into our parsonages and into our people's homes 
And if we'll listen, we'll hear him saying, Pilgrims, are you ready? <laughs> and if we can say, Lord, <laughs> we're ready. Is the fire ready? Oh, I want to tell you tonight, his answer to us will be, the fire's ready, the fire's been ready since the day of Pentecost. And my heart's cry tonight is that we would just look up and say, Oh, God, let the fire fall. Let the fire fall. Let it burn what it needs to burn. Let it cleanse what it needs to cleanse. Let it open the channels. Let it allow the Holy Spirit to flow through. Let the fire fall. <laughs> I would just like to ask you tonight, as we go, is there any cry in your heart for God to send the fire where you live? Is there any cry in your soul that says, Lord, I'm so sick and tired of operating on human effort and human instrumentality? If there is, I just wonder, I just wonder tonight, before we pull off of this grounds, if we couldn't spend some time talking to the Lord and saying, Now, Lord, you've helped us during camp. We've surged. God's come. Blessing has been ours. But, Lord, when we drive out that gate, we're going back into the world the way it is. We're going back to lonely vigils praying in the morning. We're going back to little churches instead of big crowds. We're going back to a plunking piano instead of the dexterity of what we've had here. We're going back to hard scrabble. We're going back to lonely times. We're going back to places where we haven't seen anybody really won for a good while. Lord, would you let the fire fall? I'd like for you to stand with me, if you would, this evening.